What is going on, guys? Happy Wednesday, and welcome to the Wednesday Night Live stream. We got Alec from Shimmy's Reef on tonight. How you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Yes, sir. So the tank's looking good behind you um, today. Yes, it is. Today it is. Uh, I mean, uh, the last time I was uh, on with you, it was I didn't have even have a tank. That behind was me disaster day last time you were on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Um, it's been what I think almost eight months. Yeah, it's been a while. It's actually going quite well. I am very happy with it. Everything's leveled out. Everything's constant. I don't want to change anything right now. So <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Good. Well, given the last tank had a little a slight explosion, um, I'm happy to see that you're back at it and that the tank is looking good and thriving again. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I I think it's more than thriving. I'm I'm so stoked right now with it. So uh, that's awesome. So today we thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about our good old friend Ick, which seems to be in most tanks. And you can either be hardcore and quarantine and treat and hopefully never get it in there, but that's few and far between. Most people is probably in there. Whether or not you actually see it depends on how well you manage it. So I figured Ick management would be a, a good rabbit hole for this Wednesday. Yeah, so I mean, um, I, I guess I'll get, uh, I get it asked a lot, you know, like, uh, is it a disease, parasite, this and that, you know, before you actually get into ick, you should at least have a little bit of a knowledge, I guess, to the actual cycle. Yeah. Once you like really understand the cycle and how the pa parasite actually will transform, how it will go into different stages, then you will have a better understanding on what you can do to help manage it in yep. your system so right now we're just going to talk strictly about the cycle and actually managing it because right. quarantine is sort of a different topic all right we'll maybe see if we can get to it but so i usually like starting off in our substrate and mind you the substrate yes sand but substrate can be considered uh our equipment our glass uh frag plugs coral so we'll we'll, mm -hmm. we'll touch base when i when i do full circle but right. so in the in the uh in the substrate you will start with the reproduction phase so the ick parasite at this phase is called a tamant and it's basically a large cell or, or, but we're actually talking at the microscopic level right now so when you start off you have the uh tamant now, inside the tomant, okay, you have basically 200 to like 1,000 childlike cells inside this tomant, which are called tomites. So when this thing is ready and it has reproduced and it's ready to flourish, it will then find itself and it will pop out of the substrate and it will go into the water, the water column. So when it goes into the water column, this is when, um, well, let me back up. The tomant, when it's in the substrate, mm -hmm. that's your magical three to 72 days or 80 days. Ah, that that's a life cycle. It will actually stay in substrates. So that's gotcha. that whole, like, when people talk about quarantine, how many days you have to quarantine, that's why people say three to 72 days or 80 days. That's why, because hmm. this is how long the cell will actually live inside this substrate so going back when it hatches these uh tines are then released into the water column and then this is when it starts the beautiful infectious stage little punks so these tomites will then float into the water uh, are the water column and now they are called thurons so this is a interesting part of the cycle there's gonna be two parts of this cycle where uv can actually come into play to help manage this parasite because when it's in this infection stage and it's trying to find its host these thurons are going to live up to 48 hours 
in the water column. So if you have your uh, UV set to a, uh, to, a, to a flow rate, which you are trying to get rid of parasites, not algae, mm -hmm. this will help diminish that population. And then this next stage, it'll lessen the outcome. Yeah. So uh, once it finds a host, uh, basically your fish, uh, this thurant will then turn into the uh, trifont. So uh, hold on, let me just move this. So. Yeah, I, I got the graphic <laughs> pulled up too now. Okay, there. Um, so, and this is called the feeding stage. And this is where um, these trifonts will actually latch on to the skin of the fish. And that's when you get the whole white dots. The white dots are not actually the parasite itself. The white dots is, a, it's basically scar tissue from hmm. the parasite actually burrowing into the skin. And what you see, those, uh, those white dots are basically dead skin cells and dead um, scales that have been popped up and this and that. So it's not actually, you will not see the parasite like, huh, a, crazy. like a worm or something. Like that. So that's kind of the aftermath of it being there rather than the parasite itself. Yeah. So they're, they're going to latch on and they're going to feed and they'll feed for about three to 10 days. So during this time, uh, I, I had a, you know, a bad ick out outbreak actually a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of my tangs and everything, they had icks. And so um, there's a few things you can do. Um, you can yank all the fish out and put into quarantine and put copper in and then kill off the parasite. Awesome. Some uh, systems, it is almost impossible to catch a fish. <laughs> You know, you have thousands of dollars worth of coral sticking out, especially yep. the stick guys. You're going to be going around with a net like this. You're going to be breaking coral. And I don't feel like ripping out my whole tank just to get one. I, I spent four or five hours just trying to catch a damsel one time. Just the amount of <laughs> over like two weeks, you know, you're like 20 minutes a day with the nets trying to catch the little punks. So it can definitely be a challenge. So, I mean, I, I've tried. Uh, they have uh, I've actually done it before. You get the small, tiny hooks. And you put a little uh, a piece of food on it. Actually, fish go fishing for your oh, fish. Crazy. Sometimes it takes a couple of tries, but you can actually manually fish for your fish. Hmm. Uh, but what I do for, uh, most of the time, I don't take the uh, fish out. So um, I rely on the natural uh, remedies, and that's having nutrition, fish nutrition. And that's one thing that I'm a huge stickler about feeding try, and spe especially providing the type of food for the specific species of fish. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, they're like, okay, a bunch of uh, fish in and I'm going to get some, I'm going to get some PE pellets and some ISIS. I'm good. So for the most part, yeah, I guess. But that's like telling, saying a human. So you're only going to be able to eat pizzas and burgers for the rest of your life. Yep. We need more. We need we need vegetables. We need vitamins. We need we need we need uh, all you know amino acids. All, all that stuff. So I try to give a variety of food uh, to um, all all my inhabitants, especially focusing on boosting their immune systems. Because if your fish is strong and has a strong immune system, even if it has ick, yeah. Yeah, it's going to get the white dots in the set, but it's going to be strong enough to let the parasite actually feed off of it mm -hmm. and then fall off. So and then continue. On. Uh, I've always been of the theory like I've unless it was like extremely bad, I would always avoid trying to catch a fish and take it out because I personally feel that it just stresses them out more. And the more stressed they are, the more susceptible they are. Where if you provide them like a nice zen, happy environment, you know, low stress, then they're more likely to be healthier and get over it. And that's always been kind of my mentality. Unless, of course, it's really bad or it's brand new fish before you've introduced it. But something yeah. that's already in the tank, then, you know, I think it's best to just try and stretch them out the least amount possible, right? Definitely. I mean, uh, yeah. after, I, after I go over the uh, ick thing, I, I, I do want to touch about um, just 
cr creating a, this might sound like like the Zen stuff, whatever, but actually oh, creating a habitat and a, a nice place for your fish to actually live. So they're not stressed out. They're not getting sick because they're stressed out. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to the reef, reef cycle, uh, the reef cycle, the um, uh, egg cycle, yeah. so many cycles in this hobby. I know. Uh, <laughs> cycles of more cycles. Uh, so uh, the Trafont period or the white dots. So they're going to be feeding on your, um, uh, your, your fish for about three to 10 days. After this, this is when you get into something called the drop off. So after it feeds, it has gained its, uh, you know, strength and the little parasites going to keep going on. It's going to drop off and it turns, it turns into the prod. Uh, if I always say it wrong, I think it's the protomont. Protomont. Yeah. That's how I read it. Yeah, the protomont. Um, in this stage, it is now going back into the water column to find its place to nestle in and to um, reproduce. And again, this is a good place to sort of get in there. And if you have a UV uh, for about two to, I think, uh, 20 hours, this is when these guys are actively in the water column. And if they get flushed through the UV, uh, it can help lessen the uh, s severity or yeah. the population of it. Because this is really what it is. Management is really, it, if you want to put it into a nut nutshell, it's actually ick population control. Yeah. If, if you have less ick in there and it's still cycling, okay, cool. It's when it gets out of control and you're not, not doing anything about it, just like algae. You know, just like your phosphates. If you just let your phosphates go through the roof, you know, you're going to have problems. Same with ick. If you let it mm -hmm. go through, through and let it keep multiplying and multiplying without anything helping it or trying to keep population down, yeah, you're going to have a crazy outbreak. Yeah, so true. So, yeah, so it is an interesting yeah. point. You know, there, there's out of the whole life cycle, there's only two stages where UV is actually going to be effective on taking them out. Yeah. yeah. So, because uh, th there's a lot of arguments, like uh, people always tell me, oh, UV, it doesn't do anything to it. Well, in a sense, it's 50 50. And, and it's with it, there's no magical cure. There's nothing you can pour into your tank. There's no, there's nothing that you can do t to eradicate it unless you're willing to dump copper into your display tank. Very well, Coral. Yeah. Quarantine. Or they'll take everything out, and then if they leave a tank fishless for about 80 days it dies out and then you can start over sure but i don't feel like doing that over and over yeah so and this also when people say well how, how can you get it you know you can get it from you know this period as well you know i go to my fish fish store and i go buy a fish and yeah i don't put the water in there but i net them out throw them in there those water mo molecules have ick on them. So there you go, you introduced it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, same with coral. You got that beautiful coral you got, you did all your crazy dips and everything, it, dips aren't gonna kill the parasite. And mm -hmm. You're popping that straight in. So, and that's another argument that I get into a lot, or not argument, but a debate. Yeah. With people that do strict quarantine, then I ask them, well, do you quarantine your coral for 80 days? No, I'm just popping the tank. Which is why most people are at the management stage. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, I, th th those th the people that do one hundred percent quarantine for everything, I, who Good knows? On you. That is amazing. Like, yeah. Listen, I've I've lost a lot of fish before, you know, due, due to diseases and parasites, and it's it's a, it's a horrible thing. Um, but I'm just stuck with management, especially yep. with day to day work kids this and space as well mm -hmm. okay so interesting question in this chat from mike if you stir up the sand while it's in the first stage will that bring them into the water column and get them to go through the uv well put it this way i don't know <laughs> um when i'm talking about one stage say the thermot period mm -hmm. there's another stage ready going on yeah the drop off stage is going on already well technically you think about it there's going to be tons of them in different stages of the life cycle all the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like they all yeah. do the same thing at the exact same time. Yeah. It's going to be, you and know, that, everyone's shifted. 
Exactly, and, and that's why it sucks so much, and why, why it's so hard to get a control of and get, get a handle on, is because the cycle is always just, it's, it's a circle, mm -hmm. it just keeps going around and around, so even if you stir up your sand bed, yep. you know, and, and you, and you want to release what's in there, there's going to be uh, different stages where um, you're stirring that sand, this is just for argument's sake, mm -hmm. you're stirring up that sand, and say those... Um, guys are, that were ready to release, release, but say there were stages where those guys just landed in that sand before you mm -hmm. stir, stir it up, and they're actually still latched onto those granules. They're inside the actual granules of the sand. That's yeah. how small these guys are. Ooh, actually, I pulled that little microscope photo. So that's actually what they look like under the microscope. So it's kind of cool. It's actually the first time I've ever even seen what they look like. Super tiny mm -hmm. little things. Little blobs. Of yep. Mayhem. Blobs of Vic. <laughs> mayhem blobs. Yeah, pretty crazy. So, yeah. now there's been a few people mentioning too with H2O2 dips or dosing H2O2. Have you experimented with that at all? Like dosing it to the tank? Sorry. Uh, have you, 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 you cut out. Okay. Um, there's a couple of mentions in the chat about doing a hydrogen peroxide dip or dosing hydrogen peroxide to the tank for ick. Have you experimented with that chunk of it at all? I've experimented. I, I, I experimented with everything, all the different elixirs, all of the different. Like the only thing that I, I've I've seen maybe help, hmm. and maybe it's just it maybe it was just by chance. I actually did the the rally treatment one time. Yeah. Because I had some of my. Um, uh, it was a really bad outbreak, so it was, I was like, oh, "What do I do?" Uh, so I I tried rally it. It worked, but like. Dosing hydrogen peroxide, I, I haven't really seen any difference. I mean, one thing that I have been wanting to do for a long time is actually set up actual ick tanks. Interesting. Just for experimenting on? Yeah, and actually set up in, 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 my, in my basement, set up mm -hmm. like maybe three tanks and like make sure like I get water samples from like all over the place. Just yep. dump it in there. Just make sure I have ick. And then you know, find, uh, you know, probably get some Tamini Tangs or something like that. Mm -hmm. Put them in each one and see what will do it. You know, put a UV on one and just have UV put, uh, and dose this. And, and because I don't think there has any like, real studies that have been done on marine egg, especially mm -hmm. on, for the hot level. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been trying to find reports and you can get lost in a lot of the scientific, you know, you know, not mumbo jumbo, but the scientific lingo of, you know, how it comes from the metamorphosis and the, all all this stuff. But uh, practical um, uh, in, imputation of um, eradicating ick. You know, there hasn't been any type of breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, another one in the chat, uh, poly polyp lab medic. Have you ever used or tried that one? I, I have some. I've never tried it though. The stuff. Yeah, looks like the stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's like little little pellets. Um, again, like I had ick, or I mean, I, I always have ick, but when when I have a breakout, um, I have put this in the tank mm -hmm. when I had you know visible spots on it. I put it in there, and three to nine days, the spots go away. You know, yeah, I've done it without this stuff during nine days the spots go away so again it's hard to really tell I that's why i really want to test out like you know individual tanks and just have this stuff mm -hmm. in one tank and see if it'll do something but again yeah. all this stuff that you put into the tank it's meant to help alleviate pain mm -hmm. for the fish and give the fish relief yeah. it will not eradicate and get rid of it mm -hmm. that's fair it's yeah it is interesting because i mean it is something which there's a bazillion you know elixirs for it but how many of them work does it actually work that's why i don't know that's why i'm just like keep them stress-free keep them healthy and let them naturally fight it off yeah so and that's that's the way i i reef that's the way i take care of my uh, you know fish uh, i have like a whole slew and variety different types of foods, coral foods, amino yeah. acids. And like uh, another 
thing that people always forget. Like your, everybody thinks amino acids. You're you you're putting that into your tank for your uh, coral. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fish actually benefit too. Um, fish will actually absorb aminos through their skin. Uh, so all that stuff, uh, you know, even putting aminos into say, you have like uh, the pea pellets. Uh, my my go-to thing that I do when I'm uh, when it's pellet day, uh, I'll get a shot glass. Yeah. And then uh, put the pellets in, and then I'll I'll add different additives like Celcon. Vitachem, uh, amino acids. Uh, there's even this da- a dietary supplement for humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, Do you use it the beta, fishies? Beta glucan. Hmm. Beta glucan. Uh, that's great stuff, uh, and it helps boost the immune system. And with fish, uh, actually, I actually learned it from uh, I think Bobby from uh, Humble Fish. Yep. Uh, I, I was talking talking to him for a while about uh, the, the beta, beta glucans. And it's good for that uh, for um, lymph when, when the fish get that too. So, nice. beta glucans. I haven't even heard of that one. I'll have to investigate this one more later. Now, out of all the stuff you've tried, what do you feel has been the most effective so far? Honestly, I think it's just fish nutrition and fish health. And uh, I don't know if someone made it up, but uh, I, I, I call it the uh, the three H's. Mm-hmm. Uh, husbandry, uh, health, and habitat, yep. and those can, those are all intermixed. You know, with with husbandry, you know, are you water changes, cleanliness, um, making sure parameters are correct, no swings in salt, make sure all your levels are correct. Um, with uh, habitat, plays a huge role. Uh, in stress within fish agreed because um, the way i aquascape i think about the different types of fish that i'm going to introduce into that tank from there then i'll figure out like this type of fish needs more of caves uh, this type of fish like this type of ras what likes the rocks and the little mounds of rocks to go in and out of uh, mm. this type of fish likes a sandy bottom so if you can like create little tiny eco spaces for every single type of inhabitant that you have in your tank and everybody has a place to go to yeah that that is big places to go to you know uh hiding spots um the more hiding spots you have the less aggression especially with tanks that that one's big if you have like some of the like very minimalistic aquascapes they're, they're going to be scrapping every night over who gets, you know, the prime arches and the prime little caves, or if you have very, a ton of like, you know, holy or lots of different arches, lots of little nooks and crannies all through your rock work, there's not going to be that aggression because everyone's going to have little holes to go into where they're not fighting over it. And I find that actually makes a pretty big difference. Huge, huge yep. difference. I mean, like, again, like ima- imagine if you were uh, in a small room with like 10 people and there was one bed and it's time for bed. Yeah. You guys all going to crawl into that one, like, single little tiny bed? <laughs> Jumps in at no. first, try and push each other out, get your space. Push each other out. Some people are going to be uh, sleeping on the floor. And what happens when you sleep on the floor and you wake up the next morning? You don't feel good. You know, you're aching. And you're sleeping with the with, ick and the sound. With, like, the fish, too, you know? Yeah. They're stressed out. He's now aching. I didn't have a good good night's sleep. I don't feel like eating. Mm-hmm. And so that, that kind of cycle will then happen. So I'm huge huge uh, uh advocate for uh, creating a aquascape that is not only vis- and i get it I, people want a visually appealing aquascape you know yes we are, have this like work of like living art in our offices and homes but um you got to balance it make sure it's visually appealing but at the same time it works for the fish yeah 100 percent Sid, quick shout out. Thank you for the super chat. Um, I 100% agree, though. Having a hole and home for everybody plus some make a big difference. Like that, that is huge for reducing aggression because it gives people a way to hide out. You know, if someone's bullying them or stressing them, they're not going to see them 24 7, right? They can go hide in their nook and cranny, or if it's all open, they're going to see them and they're going to be more intimidated all the time. And it just adds to the stress level, which makes them more susceptible. So, yeah. And, 
like again, when stress levels go up, that's when health goes down. You know, mm-hmm. when even like in uh, us humans, when, when you're stressed out and you're thinking about like, oh my god, work or this and that, it's not. And if you are stressed, stressed, stressed all the time, your body will slowly start to shut down. You'll either get the sniffles, you get sick, you get a headache all the time, and your 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 health technically will actually decrease as your stress levels go up. You know, that's you know, the thing about people with, with, with having uh, heart attacks and, and high, high blood pressure. Yeah, all stress you know, related. If, if you sort of think in the way the fish, you know, <laughs> are thinking in a sense, you know, the same thing's going to happen. You know, they're going to be stressed out. Their, their quality of health is just going to depreciate and keep going down and lower and lower. And that's when all of a sudden, oh my God, I have white spots all over my fish. Uh, yep. Or, oh my God, you know, what's this slimy stuff, you know, or the brook. You know, that's when that stuff is going to really start to latch on. Because the, these parasites and diseases don't just... It's very rare for, for them to just latch onto a fish and then boom, kill the fish. Yes, you have like more of the, I, I'm, I won't get into it today, but like like velvet and, and brook, you know, that's mm-hmm. completely Nasty. different animal, but, you know, ick. Um, but in terms of ick and, you know, other types of uh, sicknesses or diseases, you know, for the most part, fish that are healthy and strong will not be as successful susceptible to these things yeah they, they they're, be- they're better at fighting it off exactly yeah and again that goes back to management mm-hmm. and how you know when you're dealing with ick management that's what you're doing you're basically thinking about the fish all the time you're what are you feeding it uh wh- what kind of water is it uh you know what are you feeding it are, are, are the salinity levels going like up and down, up and down? Are, you know, alkalinity levels, you know, all, all of these levels that people think that are only related to corals and they're worried about the corals. Oh my God, my alkalinity is going up and down or my salt's going up and down. Oh my God, my corals, corals, corals. The fish are actually, you're, you might not see it, mm-hmm. you know, but your corals are getting stressed out as well when parameters are not, you know, you know, constant or, or, or to par. Yeah. So and then all of a sudden that's when you see a type of outbreak. Yeah, very true. So yeah, usually some of the stress factor and eventually it wears them down, and then it gives an opportunity for the ick or whatever pest to thrive. <laughs> Waiting for the little one cameo. <laughs> oh, she just knocked over the light. So oh, that's what that was. <laughs> We're only live. Bye. <laughs> It gets dark in the room. Yeah. Um, now, another thing is, too, um, not overstocking your tank. If your tank's too overstocked, I mean, again, you're likely going to run out of habitat and hidey holes for everybody, and that's going to add to the extra stress to an extent. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean that's that, that's another uh, big argument, too, with, like, how many tanks can you have in a certain amount of volume of water? Um, me, personally... I don't think there is a written rule. Mm-hmm. Um, there are guidelines, I should say, and some of those guidelines can be bent and uh, manipulated in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, if I have a 10 gallon or five gallon, I'm not going to put three tanks in there. Yeah. But if you're talking about like a 90 gallon, you know, I, I had a 90 gallon for a long time. I, I upgraded to the to the to the one the 110 whatever this is, and even with the 90, I had you know five tanks. Uh, hmm. Again, it, it really depends on what you are providing for the fish. If you're people are say, well, oh, but you're not the, the, there, there's not there's not enough swim room. Yes and no. You know, I, well, I get are it, they you know, little like tanks or are they like, full like, grown tanks? Right? Too like there's. Others have to place into it as well. Oh yeah, I mean, like like a the size of tang and also like a type of tang, like mm-hmm. for, for like the um, the hippos, they're they're open water swimmers. They love yeah. to zoom back and forth. And if you have a smaller tank, there's going to be it's like a ping pong ball, you know, swimming back and forth in the tank. 
but but with in terms of um, amount of fish in general, mm-hmm. if you can really narrow down um, environments and habitats for against specific type of fish, you can have as many fish as you can that will fit those parameters. Mm-hmm. You know, like for example, like um, getting those small little neon gobies. You know, they're about like this big. You yeah. know, put in like ten of them there if you wanted to, and mm-hmm. they will not really. They won't get stressed out or anything. They'll they'll find their little little tiny uh, little niches and holes, and again, it's, it's finding the right uh, fit for the fish in terms yeah. of habitat. No, for sure. Now, with the other thing is, people always rate it by volume of water, right? They're like, oh, a 90 or a 40 or whatever. But I do agree, though, to an extent that the swimming space does make a big difference, right? If you have, you know, a six foot tank versus a four foot tank, that extra swimming room goes a long way. Melanie, thank you as well. Um, so it d- definitely. Oh, um, so. <laughs> The extra length, I feel you can get away with a lot more with fish too, rather than like a tall tank, right? Because it gives a lot more room yeah. for habitat, a lot more swimming space, a lot more room for little caves and different things. So length length over tall for more fish, I find works out pretty well. Well, and just in, in general, just like tall tanks, if you've had a tall tank, you know the troubles with... Servicing it? Going inside there and having... A tank pit or whatever, you know, wet sleeves, whole water up to the pit. Yep, <laughs> reaching down in there, having a step ladder. This even with like the grabbers or times, it's hard to. Sometimes it's just better. It's easier to place stuff with your hands than like tongs and like it's tongs are tricky. Yeah. Tongs are tricky. If you are ever building a custom tank, when you're figuring out your stand height, just measure like your armpit, and that should be like the max of the brim of your tank. If it's yeah. any taller, it just becomes a bugger to deal with anything. Yeah, um, I ordered a little bit taller of a tank this time around. Yeah. Because I have restrictions this way, and yes, I use a little step ladder, so I'm not. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's fair. I could, I, I can almost reach the bottom if I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm like on my tippy toes, but <laughs> tippy toes, the tips of your fingers. Um, okay, he's asking, would you mind showing the foods again? Okay, so what all do you use for foods? Okay. Whew. Let's go through so, the list. What do you got? Okay, so what I got, these are, I, I, I didn't bring them all out, but um, so uh, some of these I like because they actually don't raise your phosphates. And especially mm-hmm. with, with how much I'm feeding, yeah. I'm always looking at my phosphates. Do you feed with a shovel? Mice, this and yeah. copepods, all this stuff in there, and yeah, I run socks and I that's, I switch them out a lot. I'm trying to get all that uneaten food out of the tank as quick as possible, but it's going to get stuck into places. It's going to rot out. You know, I have a good cleanup crew, but phosphates do start. To go it happens. Up. Yep. So uh, to uh, remedy that. Um, I have coral foods sometimes that are dual purpose. They're coral foods and uh, foods that, for example, antheas and chromis and those fast, uh, those uh, quick, quick metabolized, uh, quick metabolized uh, fish or, or the fish with the quick metabolisms. Yeah. Antheas, chromises, and the fish that like to dart everywhere. Uh, they like all the smaller, the, 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 the planktons and uh, freeze-dried coop pods. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I use actually Elos uh, uh, Science. It's actually for its coral food, but at the same time, uh, the chromises and antheas, they just pick all this stuff out in the water column. So that's one thing. Um, good old good old fashioned reef chili. Yep. You know, I use this stuff. And again, um, I sometimes will get like a, again, I'll use this, shot glass because this is this is dried stuff so i'll get a shot glass and then i'll add either Cellcon, uh vitachem uh elos has a um it's a vitamin complex that i actually add to it so it gives mm-hmm. it's a whole like basically it's a whole spectrum of 
all the different types of vitamins that you possibly need. Nice. So I just put like a couple drops of this. Um, I also have a, like a free, freeze dried mysis, uh, reef, reef candy by, I think this is Reef Chasers, I think, does it, which is good. He gave me a couple samples of this stuff. Nice. Fish like it, corals like it. And so it, you can see my trend. I sort of, I broadcast feed so I can sort of kill two birds with one stone. I'm feeding the fish and, yep. and the all coral. Of the coral. I, I do the same thing. It, it's not very often I'll like spot feed corals. I will once in a while, like once every like few weeks. Like sometimes I'll be motivated. I'll do it a couple times and then I won't do it for like a month. I'll do it. But I broadcast feed the tank daily. And yeah. Like even frozen, I never rinse frozen because my theory is all those little particles is just coral food. So I don't want to waste exactly. that. Yeah, for us, uh, uh, same with the with the frozen mices. Mm -hmm. I actually stick it into a shot glass and I'll put in uh, either I'll add in the uh, Brightwell uh, microplankton or whatever. Yep. And again, I'll be feeding coral and the fish at the same time. So it's a lot of broadcasting, but the Thing that I gotta, you know, really uh, emphasize is you gotta watch the phosphates and pay attention to your filtration system. I'm a heavy in, heavy out type guy. Yeah. So if that's how your system is set up, you know, it's it's a it's a good way to do it. If you are a heavy in and you just have a skimmer or or only just filter socks or something going to have to watch your phosphates because those are going to start to creep up quicker. So, okay. So what is your heavy out strategy? What, what do you use for export? Okay. Export. So, uh, mechanical, um, I have my, uh, skimmer yep. and I have an oversized skimmer. I have the, the, the regal, I think 150 SS, whatever the, the octo one. Um, it's rated for, I think like 300 gallons or something. Nice. So I have that guy. And he's and he's always producing just like coffee, black skin mate. Lovely, uh, lovely. Wife loves it too. Uh, um, uh, my socks. I try to. I'm. I try to switch out my socks every couple of days. Um, people are always telling me, "Why don't you have a roller mat? Because it won't fit." And I don't feel like ripping apart my system right now. Sure. Next one, sure. I'll, yeah. I'll look into it. Um, but uh, I try to be very um, religious about my uh, sock changing. I have two, two full, full size 14 inch socks and they go down. I try to change them out every two days. That's good. If I'm lazy, right. if, if I'm lazy and either I'm working or I just forget about it, sometimes they're in there for a week and then I walk downstairs. What's that trickling noise? Oh, the socks yeah. are flowing. Cool. <laughs> yeah, a week sounds more appropriate. Like five to seven days. Every other day, like good on you for actually doing it every other day. I, I, I try. I, I, I try to do it almost every other day. And again, with how much I feed. Again, people are like, just do it, dude. Just get a, get a roller mat. I know. I know. It's in the works. Um, but I do have like a whole like drum of socks that mm -hmm. I just constantly, I have a, I have the, dirty dirty pile and a clean pile and i'm just and every week i'll just every two weeks i'll just dump those things in there's a tight fitting lid on it so those smells don't escape into the <laughs> ether and uh make the inhabitants of this home mad <laughs> yep wise wise i um would agree that's actually one of the bigger one of the other benefits of filter rollers is not dealing with a big bucket of smelly socks but yeah so and then um i guess it's also it's uh it's mechanical, but I guess biological as well. I do have a uh, clear water scrubber, yep. which uh, works quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been, it's my first time using a scrubber on a system, I'm using it for eight, eight, eight months, basically. Nice. Or they they technically, do, they do work really well. Six, six months. Yeah. They, they, they do pull a lot. They do work very well. They do. They do pull a lot. Um, so then it's just that. Uh, I have the two, uh, two, 50, well, I think they're 52 or 50 something watt uh, UVs. Yep. That's for them. I was going to ask you earlier do you actually run UV on your tanks? You have dual UVs. Yeah. I have two. I have dual two uh, 50 Is it something watt. The, the one unit and, that has two tubes, or did you put two separate units on? No, I have two separate units. Oof. I have. Oof. Like, 
yeah. side by side. So I have, I, I had to put in a manifold, so I'm not just recycling the sump. I actually have it pulling out from the, uh, uh, the chamber, uh, the first chamber, and then actually gets pumped actually into nice. uh, the top of the tank into the display. So it's straight from sump, and so I'm constantly circling. Yeah. Nice. And yes, they're they're both uh, tuned for parasites. <laughs> so, what? I guess what flow rate do you run through them for parasites? Um, honestly, I, I'm not hundred percent sure. Mm -hmm. I what I do, I get like a gallon. I get a gallon bucket. And time I it. Really timed it uh, for it was like like it took like a like maybe a minute for a gallon. It's like a thousand and, gallons per hour. -ish. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah, 600. so it, it, it's a slower, slower rate. So yeah. It's a slower rate. Yeah, nice. Uh, if, if you're setting up for algae, you want a, a quicker flow rate. Because mm -hmm. it'll, it'll work better. Um, and then what else for filter? Oh, I, I do run uh, um, R, RX Carbon yep. slash um, uh, GFO in two reactors. Nice. Bo both mixed. I, I, I don't have like a carbon reactor or a GFO. They're actually both basically a GFO, carbon, GFO, carbon, GFO, carbon. Uh, and no, it doesn't clump up. They're mixed nicely. Excellent. And, uh, I've never had an issue mixing them personally. Like I've never had it like clump up or get hard. Like I, I know some people say that, but for whatever reason, I've just never experienced that. The only time I had it really clump is when I uh, just, I packed GFO when, yeah. I, when I first started, I'm like, oh, GFO, okay, this is cool stuff. And I packed Shoved really it tight, there. put it into the reactor. You know, slowly, the flow started stopping. I'm like, okay, maybe maybe I should change it. It's like, it's like a cylinder block. <laughs> oh, that's funny. On that note, I definitely do have to change my phosphate. Thank you for the reminder. Or not my phosphate, real phos, GFO. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then um, filtration, I think, I think that's it, yeah. That's it. I, I don't I don't do anything else special. I mean, um, I religiously add Microbacter Clean, Microbacter Seven, almost every single day to the tank. Mm -hmm. um, um, I did try the uh, pr a pro probiotics stuff. Yep. Uh, I've been using that now. With the little, little you know the little glass vials. Okay. How do you like that? You know, um, I've been using it now for, I think, three months, and I do see less and less. I, I, I have seen a le lesser amount of green film hmm. nice. everywhere. So, and I noticed the uh, water cl clarity has been really clear. Nice. So, bacteria I, is your friend. I use that one. Yeah ages ago but I, I haven't even seen it really for sale in ages but i used to see it all the time so that's what I was yeah curious. i mean um uh, I, i'm uh, helping out at elos basically so yep. uh they actually gave me a whole huge like startup pack to tr try it out oh nice and i guess they're trying to uh promote uh elos i guess and start their own like um elos america yeah because elos is very popular in you know europe in the sense so they're trying mm. to spread the word you know and you know yeah heels makes nice stuff yeah, nice. Nice. but yeah so I, I i've been using this stuff and it's i like it i i've seen a difference and then in terms of filtration i think i think that's it um i do water changes sometimes that's what sometimes. your face said to me once in a while on full moons. i mean if <laughs> if i see it looking murky i'm like eh, maybe you know <laughs> my my water change is mainly provoked when I want to vacuum the sand every few months. That's like what I've been using to actually do them once in a while. Because I had them automated, then I toned it down, and then I kind of back and forth. But I I had mine automated, and I had like it was basically doing like a gallon, like a, you know, like a half a gallon a day, or like a gallon a day, or something. Yeah. I just had it constantly, and I was just going through salt, <laughs> a lot yeah. of it. It happens. I was always mixing it. And I, and I have like two big uh, brutes downstairs, mm. and I was always mixing, always mixing them through the hop. So I've toned mm. it down myself. And when I um, really stir stuff up, and when I uh, vacuum out the sand, that's well, I'll, I'll do the manual. Mm -hmm. And then 
I'll switch on the uh, the uh, auto change, and it'll like do like thirty gallons in like forty, like twenty four hours or something, yep. thirty eight hours or something. Goes. Nice. It, it it's so, nice to be able to push button water change. It is. Yep. I'll, I'll I'll be at work and like you know what water change. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I guess I'll do some work today. Click a button. Done. <laughs> yep. Um, but, but I mean, but I mean like like. People always, I, I, there's there's a few of my buddies that always give me a hard time, like, oh, you're, you know, Mr. Like, uh, Apex of controllers and this and that. I told them, listen, I'm at work a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I've been, this is my first night not, not doing night work. Yeah. I do, I do construction in Manhattan. I told them, like, listen, during the day, whatever, my wife, she's like, I'm not going to touch your tank. I don't want, no. First yeah. of all, they... They look pretty, but they smell gross, and I'm not touching. Plus, I don't want to like mess anything up and like kill all your corals and corals and things. Fair. So, so I'm okay there. Um, yep. uh, but yeah, so I, I like a little bit of auto, automation. I don't like have everything on a click click of a button, uh, but for life safety stuff and yeah. just being aware of where things are during the day or if I leave for the weekend, mm. I have a little bit of that's fair i i was laughing on one of my last videos i don't know if it was the i tried it one or i did one on building the diy co2 thing and someone commented they're like oh this is about he's like the hobby is about tech not about roofing anymore which it doesn't have to be right it, it depends no. on the person like i i am a techie i work in it i love the tech i love automation and the more stuff i can automate means i have more free time to spend the family enjoy the tank whatever it may be right I'd rather, you know, check out the tank than do work the whole time. But that being said, I don't mind puttering at stuff. Like, I still enjoy that as well. But it's all a trade-off, you know? Spend the time or spend the money and buy the toys to give you more time. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really what I tell my wife friends yep. when, when they're giving me a hard time. And they're like, well, you don't need all that fancy stuff. I'm like, yeah. I don't need but, it, but I like it. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And... Um, Honestly, I hate testing, so mm-hmm. I'm not testing my alkalinity, you know, every single day or every other day. Like now, I, my al- alkalinity is like tested like six times a day. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> Easy. Okay, so on the ick side, so Heath was asking, when you first notice ick showing up and you can't take the fish out, do you do any treatment or just keep them eating and let them fight it out? So personally if it's very minor i would literally just make sure they're not stressed out i'd make sure they're eating lots of healthy stuff you know if they're make sure they're eating their nori or their veggies their proteins depends on the type of fish but just ideally just make sure no one's picking on them make sure they're not stressed out and just keep your water primers good and just keep them eating healthy and generally as long as the fish you know is reasonably healthy they should be able to fight it off and that's been more or less how i've done it for years and it's worked out pretty well for me so i mean I'll I'll agree with you there 100. percent Yeah. If it's if you're starting to see those dots, don't freak out. You know, don't start trying to net everything out. Oh, yep. cute! I, I, I. But the the other thing you do, <laughs> exactly, where you take deep breaths. But you gotta have a bit of observation in your tank. If it's you know partially coming up because another fish is bullying on them, then maybe that's what you gotta do. You gotta deal with that. Like when I first added a fish to my frag tank. Um, before I like reskate and redid everything, I think I added, I think it might have been the copper band, but the yellow tang was just being a ding to him. So he's just, you know, harassing constantly. So I just took some of that craft mesh and I literally, when they were in different sides of the tank, I literally built a wall to separate them. I left there for like a week so the new guy could settle in and he doesn't have to worry about the new guy kind of being a punk. And after that, perfectly fine. But it's just giving them time to settle in and not be stressed out. And that's, you know, the small approach i took to deal with it and everyone's happy and healthy now yeah actually uh i had a um it was my it was my sail fin tank. I, I i put the sail fin tang in um and my my purple is like the king king kamehameha of the reef you know he is he is he's is the boss yeah. so i put the sail fin tang on uh, to tang in um within like a minute his sails were like ripped up it was like really? cannon fire Oof. through the sails he was it looked like he was like through a blender i'm like oh now i'm like and i walk away for a minute i come back and it's like he's like ripping up i'm like oh my god um so i basically stood and watched my tank 
for about a good like hour. Mm-hmm. And I got one of those, you know, like the coral uh, acrylic rods, yeah. you know, that you can pick coral with. <laughs> I've done the so, same thing. <laughs> so as, as soon as the purple would come, I'll go, hey, 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 no, no, no. Okay. Hey, hey, no, no, no. So I did yeah. it for like an hour and I was getting tired of it. So what I did is I just left that actual acrylic rod in the middle mm-hmm. of the tank. And I put my net in the middle of the tank, just laying yeah. right, right, right in the center. For some reason, that worked. Purple stayed on that side. The sailfin stayed on that side. Perfect. I left the I left those thing in, things in for about a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Took them out. They had a couple squabbles here and there, but within I think two to three weeks, they're like best buds now. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. So yeah, sometimes you just need to. T- take a little intervention and do what you got to do to keep the peace and tell they settle in. Then after that, it usually works out. Uh, Dr. Wealths of magic tank transfer method thoughts. Um, definitely can work. Um, it is a little more work on your side and that's basically, I don't know if it's every week or every few days, but where you move the fish from one tank to a brand new system. And then after a few days or week, whatever it is, correct me if you know the answer, you move them back to another tank. And basically what yeah. you're doing is breaking the life cycle of the ick. So as they fall off the fish, in theory, after, you know, one of those X number of transfers, you're moving it as they've fallen off of him. Then they're not in the new fit, not in the new tank. Or if there is, there's less of them. Yeah, every 72 hours. Thank you. So you basically just keep going back and forth every couple of days. And as they fall off, you're, you're losing them and that tank's now sterilized, move back. And that's how you kind of break the life cycle. And that definitely can work. Yeah, I, I agree. It can work. It's, it is just, that's a lot of work. That's manual mm-hmm. tanks. And the only thing that, <clears throat> again, I, that what I don't like about it is it can't handling the fish so much. Yeah. That, that's, that's like, yes, in theory, I, I, I've never done, I think in theory, I think it, mm-hmm. it would and should work. Because personally, I think uh, handling of the fish that many times stresses add stress. Can add, add stress, you know. Now, so, constantly so. a new clean clean environment. This huge green thing scooping them up and throwing them over here. Yeah. So the other thing I want to throw to you, if you are quarantining fish, like buy some like three or four inch PVC, throw that stuff in there, give them something to hide in or a cave. It's going to make them feel more comfy and less stressed out when they have a little hidey hole to hang out in. And I see lots of, you know, stores or tanks and stuff that don't have that. It just adds a lot to just help the fish feel more comfortable and be less stressed. So I think that goes a long way. Yeah, definitely that, that, or, um, uh, my, my, my friend down the street, actually, he, uh, buys those, uh, coral inserts mm-hmm. and he actually just put a, those like PVC plastic, whatever resin yeah. coral insert into his quarantine tank. And, uh, he actually nice. had a like a like a fake uh, 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 sea anemone, mm-hmm. and he, had, he was quarantining as a, uh, uh, a clownfish, and they actually hosted that little. Oh, that's cool. Or 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 the that hosted the clownfish. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, now another one I saw come up in the chat a little while ago is do 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 do. Oh, fresh freshwater dip. You're asking about that. Have you done freshwater dips? Um, yes, I have done uh, freshwater dips for uh, fluke. Mm-hmm. Um, for ick, I didn't really bother much with it. Um, I guess it freshwater dips are not they're they're not like, crazy harmful to fish. Yes, you get again calculate stress factor too. Yeah, so that will it definitely adds stress. Freak them out. Yeah, it will freak them out. Now adds lots of stress. I I I've only done uh, freshwater dips for uh, uh, elegance corals and uh, elegance corals. I don't. I think I freshwater dipped zoas before. I think that's the only coral I've actually freshwater dipped. So I freshwater hmm. dip a elegance coral. Interesting from elegance corals. Yeah. So personally, I have never freshwater dipped a fish as preventative. I've only done it if they were already really bad as a treatment um personally now for the quarantining side because i've seen a couple of people mention it uh dr wealth not lost a fish five and a half years 12 days quarantine done so i did a similar thing i brought it up used copper power for two weeks and brought up to therapeutic level and then i did two rounds of prosy every like five days i think it is 
and it's about two weeks and that that's been my like treated quarantine when i've had questionable fish so i want to make sure they're healthy coming in um so that's was my method it's been ages i did a video on it or since i've quarantined fish because i haven't bought new fish in ages but actually i lie i got two new fish recently but they came from an lfs that pre-treat quarantined and pre-coppered and all that jazz well one thing a lot of people forget when you are quarantining and you have finished your set whatever 80 days i'll, yep. I'll I, I just like to do the 80 days because yep. when you're playing with like the 75 days <laughs> do the 80 days yeah uh but do 80 days plus another five or seven have that quarantine tank fully with no medication and anything and see what happens to the fish if there's any type of um you know a uh, reoccurrence of not reoccurrence of, uh, a relapse of any type of disease or parasite that maybe didn't get caught mm -hmm. so it's not like you know 75 days cool i could throw them back in yeah do the 75 to 80 days and then do one more week just of observation to make sure nothing comes back because those then 80 days were all wasted yeah no it's true I mean, especially over like a few days right you're already that far in what's another few days yeah. Exactly. Now, if you're buying a fish from a store that runs therapeutic levels of copper in their tank, would you worry about it or quarantine or other stuff, or would you feel fairly confident that they're likely fine? Well, for example, my um, local fish store in Clifton, uh, uh, Absolutely Fish, mm -hmm. um, I was I actually asked about their system. Yep. A lot of people don't ask about. When you're talking to your local thrift store, ask about this. Hey, can I see your system? Uh, what do you guys do? Do you guys do copper, this and that? So my uh, local thrift store, they actually do run therapeutic levels of copper. Mm -hmm. um, they're all on a single system. Yeah. Um, but, yes, they run copper. I've been using them for years and years. And years, and years. Mm -hmm. So I trust them. Yeah. You know, and but again even trust you can stuff can get in there mm -hmm. um i mean honestly e even with things being 100 100 percent you know they at three therapeutic levels um they could have just got a really healthy fish in from indonesia yep. and there it's in the system for like a day and you happen to walk in there and you're like hey can you can you feed that guy but you feed him some mice he's like eating going crazy he's like fat and beautiful I'm like you know what Yes, bag him up and take him home. Mm -hmm. He's only been on the copper for a couple of days. Yeah, true. So I, bring, you bring him in. I usually ask how long they've had the fish for. Now, if they've had That's it for true. at least two weeks, yeah. then I feel better about it already. Because you know, if they don't have anything showing up after two weeks, they're likely not too bad. And same thing, I like to use observation quite a bit. I'll watch them for a few minutes, make sure they don't look like they're stressed, make sure they don't have any spots or anything obvious with them, right? And just make sure they look like they're acting normal and not like something's up. But I think it's, observation is a long way for preventative as well. Yeah, it's a good to like get a like create a relationship with your local fish store, especially if you're going to be uh, shopping there a lot and it's not too, if you go, your go-to place. You get to know everybody. It's nice, and it's, especially like uh, you know COVID now, sort of like almost on the out, you know. It's it's nice to feel and to see people again and to interact with people and I, I've I've missed that for a while now you know being closed or masked or this and that or you have to wait outside only two people in it feels good now to you know go back in and talk to the manager or the people or even or even other customers and like interacting mm -hmm. with other people and real people and even in three D like, whenever I go I always get into the conversations and I'm like I'm down there they're looking at a fish and some guy comes up and he's like. You, you looking at that one? I'm like, yeah. What do you think? He's like, I don't know. His, his, his belly's a little pinched. No, I don't know. No, yeah. Maybe maybe that guy's better. It's, it's, it's yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it is for sure. It's nice to see people in 3D. <laughs> 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 yep. Does copper kill inverts? It sure does. Um, you cannot use copper on inverts. They will be done for. And yes. Uh, probably LFS has low salinity. Yeah, so lots of stores do run a lower salinity. It does help with pests. Um, hmm. If you do buy someone that runs like hypo or lower salinity, so I mean, some of them do save on salt, but some of them actually do it for pest prevention. 
that that's one thing we got to make sure you drip the fish over you know a period of time to acclimate them or adapt them back up to your likely reef level salinities um a lot of fish stores that run lower they'll be like 0.18 or 0.2 type of thing where most of us run our tanks at 1.025 1.026 kind of range so you do got to adapt them back up and just a note on if you are doing the freshwater dip you want to make sure you match the ph and the temperature ideally that's important to reduce the stress factor we'll go in through that dip yeah, you don't, you don't want to get, like, uh, water from the fridge and just, like, put in <laughs> Yeah, yeah, temp temperature and pH are the bigger things that will shock them, so those are the ones you want to match. Yeah. And, yeah, like, I, lots of people do it as on the way in, and I don't know. I always feel bad. I've only done it just if there's already an issue that I noticed yeah, that I'm going to deal with. Yeah, I've only done it, like, for example, I've, I've, had, I've had flukes a couple times, so I was, like, I was looking at this one fish, and I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell is on that thing? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking closer and closer, and you can sort of see the little white. And the, it's, the white it's filming in the gills, the, the ick spots. Yeah, you know, so like they have like a little bit of a, a roundness to them. You can actually tell it's something on the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's the only time I did ick, and I did like, I think like maybe a minute, maybe a minute. And as soon as I put them, you see everything will fall off like like a hair dandruff almost. Yeah, and then everything just turns like super white. And don't get freaked out because the fish will sort of like contort and like. Oh, especially yeah, yeah hippo tangs, they'll play dead. It totally yeah, like you freak will out. Just, like contort and like I'm like, oh my god, I just killed my fish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they actually, I had one. It freaked me out. What was the early days? It was playing dead. It's perfectly fine after, but it totally freaked me out though because he's like on the side. Like I'm like, what the? Yeah, I was talking to someone else. They're like, don't worry, they do that. I'm like, oof. It's weird. Like tangs, uh -huh. tangs are like especially like uh, the tip of tangs. Mm -hmm. They're 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 a weird fish. Uh, the, the other day. Um, I, I thought he was dead <laughs> and he was just wedged like face first or mouth first fins up yeah. into a rock and mm -hmm. i just see the fit the yellow fin sticking out <laughs> motionless and yeah. the, the and, and the tail is like just flapping with the flow with, with and i'm like watching the corals and the and the tail yeah and it changes direction goes this way i'm like oh my god it goes this way oh my god i think it died so i go in there and i was just gonna grab it by, by its tail and pick it up all of a sudden <laughs> yeah i'm like oh scared the crud out of me oh that yeah it it is freaky when they start jumping out of nowhere and you don't expect it they, like come and bite well, you I'm, out of nowhere it just like i don't know i don't know why but it gets you every time <laughs> it does and, and especially uh, uh uh the hippos i've had bad experiences with hippo tanks i've been i've been uh sliced by them twice already Oof. <laughs> Did it suck? It, it Was hurts. it bad? It hurts. I haven't oh, had yeah. that yet. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the first time was when my uh, tank exploded the first time the, the, before this one. So and I was totally off topic, but how did your tank explode? This is, this sounds like oh, a good story. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I believe it condolences always, again. <laughs> I've always bought used tanks, yeah. you know, and just that's ever since I was like 12 years old, I would always go to the fish store or you know whatever, and they always had like old tanks laying around, and like they would either give them to me for free or like here, yeah, here's we have five bucks, take 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 that 40 breeder or this and that. So I got a really good deal on an Oceanic Tech Tank. And, mm -hmm. oh, I I remember Oceanic Tech Tanks. They were like oh, the creme de la creme, you know, the Starfire class and you know thick glass. And, it's like built like a tank. The only flaw with these tanks is that they were made to be put on a stand that was completely open with no, you know, supports or anything. Uh, but the way the tank was built, you had the bottom or the side of the glass, the bottom pane. Um, there was a little bit of room. Mm -hmm. So I think my. Uh, seam just gave and so on the right side of my tank the whole seam going all the way across went poop like that crack across and then everything just started gushing out from the bottom Oof. yeah quickly too <laughs> dang that sucks tracy and, thank you damn that sucks i and i i walked into that too i i, I was i was at my in-laws and i i come home and I'm like 
it's that noise. I just hear the pumps running. And th- this is before I had an apex or anything mm-hmm. like that. I was like, oh, whatever. And so I, I hear just just that that hum grinding of a dry pump with no water on. Oh. And just echoing in my sump. Sump is completely dry. Water's like down to here. Yeah. Getting rags, shoving it. Oh, it was... It's bad, but the, the way the way I cut myself, I was um, trying to quickly get all my uh, fish into. Uh, I had the small holding tanks. I had a, a r- rubber made uh, drum that I got, and I, luckily I had like pre mixed water. I just brought all the water upstairs, and you know, yeah, threw all the fish in. And I was trying to get uh, one. I think it was my uh, ras. I was trying to grab out of the sand. And I guess the hippo was up against in the corner, got freaked out. He slapped me and like my full like Oof. right down the whole thing. So I had like when I'm like trying to take apart my uh, tank, I had like this like rag, I'm like blood, oh. sweat, dang had, like, tears too. <laughs> Just to add insult to injury, eh? As you're trying to save them and they're whooping you. No, that was uh, a that was like and, and, yeah, that, that was that, that was. That was my birthday ah oh, dang dang <laughs> hey i've had one tank crack on me so i feel you and that's been like it was a, a bent glass one too so i'm like scarred against bent glass now oh. but yes sim- similar thing where I, but thankfully i was home but like just home like minutes within walking in the door there had we had like the puppy crate that was right beside the tank like it was only 24 yeah. gallons like it was one of the old innovative marine bent glass ones yeah, yeah. And we're, we're in there. And we literally came in the house and like set the grocery down and heard this big bang. And all of a sudden the puppy starts freaking out. And it's just like this like crack around the corner. And the sheet of water starts coming out dousing the puppy. And I don't know how. I found like duct tape. I'm trying to like duct tape it together. And I'm like using the waters coming out to fill like laundry bins yeah. and baskets <laughs> and like buckets, whatever I can find. It's like full of like fish and coral. It's like pure chaos. So it sucks. Yeah, I, I, feel I, you. I, I had like a laundry basket too. I had like you know coral and like my live rock in, in, in it. And that's one thing. If you want to have to be ready for anything, one thing to always keep on you mm-hmm. in the basement or in a closet somewhere, keep like a forty-gallon breeder, <clears throat> a couple heaters, maybe a maybe a pump, maybe a wave maker, something if something really goes bad. You can at least put your fish into something. Yeah. <laughs> Happens. Yeah, I know it's true. I still have like a little three foot, 30, 40 gallon, whatever it is, tank in the shed. It's good to have. Or yeah. like brute containers, yeah, like mean, anything, like, just something you can make as a ghetto temporary tank. Yeah. My uh, uh, garage, my basement, I have, I think, a uh, garage, I have a, I have a couple like 20 gallons. In the basement, I have like two 40 gallon breeders, you know, so it's. It, it's the, it's the fine line though of like hoarding too much stuff versus like actually having useful backups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's always the wife's thing. They give too much fish in that <laughs> Another thing too, if you need like a quick temporary tank, like Home Depot sells these big like four foot big bins for like fifteen bucks, and those are great. Like I use those for temporary tanks when I was redoing my tank, and they're cheap and effective. I mean, while uh, my. Uh, while uh, Joe from Glass Cages was basically built, built, building this new one, I had all my live rock um, actually in a huge uh, vat like that mm-hmm. uh, in the basement. I just put a couple. I had I, I, like it was the H eighties, whatever the Kessels. Yep. I had a couple of those over those bins. Stick a wave ma- maker in there, and every couple of days I would throw some um, microbacter in there sprinkle some pellets and then all of a sudden i saw like crabs come out of nowhere i had snails coming up the sides yeah. and then i had actual coralline growing on the inside of the rubber maid oh really oh, perfect so you had that running for a while <laughs> yeah <laughs> um what's your guest name alec aka shirmy's reef so actually, on that note, if people want to ask you questions or find you, what's the best place? Uh, you can go to uh, Instagram at Shumi's uh, Reef, or uh, you can look me up on Facebook, uh, Shumi's Reef on Facebook, a, a little group, a little page. Just say hi, and then 
honestly, anytime any, anybody has a question or anything, I'm always willing and uh, eager to answer questions or even just chat. So reach out. Perfect. It's always a good time to chat and reef, right? All the time. Exactly. Um, earlier in the chat, someone's asking, is the vodka for the tanker for you? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, um, <laughs> I haven't really, you know, it's, it's funny. I can't yeah. Um, I have never dabbled with carbon dose. No, nope. I haven't, I haven't like or, or, or with, with vodka at least I have mm -hmm. done. I mean, I've, I've done it, you know, to indulge and to relax during the evening, but not actually into my grief tank. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, but I, if it's, if that comment was uh, uh, towards a, I guess post from earlier uh, today, um, it's actually uh, Orthodox Easter this weekend, and um, I'm making flavored vodkas for hmm. the celebration of festivities on Sunday. <laughs> Sounds good. What what's the best flavor so far? We need to report next week. <laughs> oh, coconut and guava is really good. Hmm, interesting. I've never tried to flavor them, but that sounds fun. I like it. <laughs> I do dried dried fruits, fresh yep. fruits, uh, pineapple, uh, raspberry, blackberries. Raspberry. Nice. Um, it's <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna try this. I want to experiment now. Um, do you worry about flatworms on some soft coral? I just inspect corals. If I see any flatworms, and I will deal with it or not add it to my tank. I actually recently, aka like two weeks ago, I bought a acro off somebody and i'm like it looks like bite marks looks like bite marks and i wouldn't put it in my tank put it under the microscope i'm like those are definitely bite marks but i couldn't see the flatworm so eventually i'm like okay i threw in some potassium salts and then like sprayed it with a little syringe and eventually some came off i'm like frick i knew it so that i just tossed the coral i'm like it's not worth it to infest the tank over a yeah, 20 dollar so, coral so, similar thing actually happened to me the other day i was uh getting a um <clears throat> I think I think you have one of these. Uh, they're the, the deeper water, with the dragon soul something. Yep. Oh, the. Uh, are you talking about deep water acros or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Red dragon. No, red, red dragon. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I I had got one of those, and I I I I was about to just throw it into my tank. I'm like, okay, you know, that's cool. Uh, and I actually I dipped it, and I got red bugs and. Hmm everything off of really thing. it was crazy crazy interesting I, right now on that note i have never had good luck dipping deep water acros i always find they do not fare well from dip at least the old I, school dips i used to do at least for this guy the the, the red dragon yeah uh, and he is thriving i at, at first at first moment when i put him in i i, I thought he was starting to bleach but uh Lo and behold, it's actually growth uh, nice. on the tips. So, awesome. so I'm like, okay, good, good. So, yeah, um, uh, the, the other other deep water one I have this, it's like a purplish blue, and I forgot it's like the, 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 the bristle brush, the bottle brush type. Okay, yeah. I forgot, I forgot what it's called, but it's like a deep blue purple guy. Nice. Um, and he's an, also another uh, uh, deeper water coral. I did yeah. him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so cor him. coral dips, what, what do you normally use? Uh, let's see. I do. I, I'm very. I'm very easy. I actually have right here the. Uh, I have the RX. I do the Coral RX, and um, and the Medi Coral and the Lugos. Okay, nice. Um, okay. The question in the chat: Are fox faces reef safe? In general, I say yes. Um, a couple of people in the chat were saying that sometimes they munch on the odd polyp. Now, any fish that's hungry enough, I find, can be opportunistic. So if you feed your fish well, they're less likely to nip at stuff. And if they're hungry, they might try and see what they can get for snacks in the middle. So that's been my experience. Fox faces, I, again, agree with you. Mm -hmm. Feed them, and they will usually, they will, sometimes they'll, I think, tend, they, they, they like, like, uh, like the zoas and stuff like that. Um, they'll, uh, if you feed them, yeah. They mm -hmm. won't go for your coral. Um, another thing with fox faces that I absolutely love, I actually consider them like the peacekeepers. Yeah. You have a, rambu a rambunctious group of tangs that are not getting along completely. 
uh, throw in a fox face in there, hmm. and he, I, I almost break guarantee he will take care of the aggression. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I had. The- I've never actually kept a fox face. I know lots of people that have them, but just one fish I've never had. So I, I've always, I love them. They mm-hmm. are, and every single one I put into my tank after um, tangs have been introduced, it's always been a lot peaceful with. Uh, the, I, that, that's why I like call them like the peacekeeper of the reef. I don't know if yeah. it's like maybe just my luck, but. That's cool though. It's, it's nice to have yeah. peacekeepers. <laughs> yeah, peacekeeper for the reef. Yeah, exactly. Um, Tracy, I have a coral beauty that picks on stuff, but it doesn't linger on any particular coral. Yeah. Dwarf angels are always a toss up. They generally tend to pick on some things. But again, that's the thing, right? If you have one tiny frag and he picks it to death, that's trouble. But if you have a tank full of coral and the odd thing, the odd nip here and there, you might not even notice. It might not be a big deal. So on a newer tank, it might be more of a risk. In an older established tank, at the end of the day, you might not even notice the odd little bit. Like I know my sailfin tank, and he, my sailfin and my hippo both nip on my gargodian, and every time they do it, it sucks in his polyps, and like a minute later, they're back out again. So it doesn't seem to affect it too much. But punks. <laughs> yeah, my uh, I have a, um, a flame flame angel. Nice. And I uh, I put in uh, like a couple sticks of a, a, a green slimer mm-hmm. and i was watching him and so uh, was, i was waiting for all the pops to come out with this right i'm like okay cool nice cool so nice and all of a sudden the flame angel comes over and just starts yeah <laughs> but again uh like I, I agree too uh you know uh, those uh dwarf angels they're, they're a toss-up so whenever, whenever it says reef safe or or with caution. Know, with caution or whatever yeah. it's, it's a it's a toss-up it's either you have to make sure you, you're feeding them all the time so they're not picking on your coral or sometimes mm-hmm. they'll just pick in your coral. It, it really depends on the fish it does it does but feeding heavy definitely reduces it it ups your odds of success for sure um yeah i've been tempted at a flame angel but it could be trouble with the coral beauty and then Oh, 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 with, yeah, with other, yeah. With other dwarf corals, yeah. I know someone that had success with it, but I also know others who have not, so it's definitely a toss-up. And then again, I could add one to the tank beside me, but then there's always that risk, is he going to nip on my corals that I add to the tank or not? Yep. One, uh, one, one um, dwarf angel that I, I, I want to get back that I added before was the uh, multi-strike multi-stripe is that pot- potters that's one they're talking about in the chat is that different the, uh, the, it's it, it almost looks like a sail it, it could you can almost see it as a sail fin but it's, a, it's an angel i i, <clears throat> I think it's a, i think it's a, called a multi oh that's cool looking angel multi-bar they're, angel fish or multi stripe yeah, multi-bar or whatever yeah i had one of those oh they're pretty huh it is. i don't know what happened to it yeah that's cool looking it, it, it's it's cool fish. My mm. uh, daughter named named him Capone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, now you're making me want a dwarf angel for this tank. We'll see. We'll see. Pot potters or a flame? Maybe one of the two. One We're of the potters. two. You, okay. Do you know what was odd? Speaking of like slight fish aggression, there was something really weird going on with um my. Melanaris wrasse and my copper band butterfly. It's like the wrasse was being a bit of a punk to the but- butterfly. He, like he's just coming up quick towards him and the butterfly flares his fins out. It's really odd. I've never actually seen like would expect anything with those two. Like right now they're fine. But earlier, like I took a video clip of it and it just was like really odd behavior with those two. I gotta see that. Yeah, I'll send it to you later. It wasn't like nothing super intense in the video, but it just is weird behavior. My Melanaris Rass, I think, is the nicest Rass in the world. Yeah, they are pretty. He's, well, he's missing his top jaw. Yeah. So he can't really attack anybody. He actually eats more. Yeah, <laughs> mine eats all of my snails. He's a punk. I, so, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I might need to get another Rass because he was eating all my snails and everything because I have a crazy population and I was keeping it down all of a sudden. 
long story short, he got into a skiff with a, uh, I think, a bristle worm, and then he was trying to rub off all the bristles off the top of his jaw. So, you know how the Melnaris Ras has a nice little point comes down for the yeah. mouth? Yep. It is like this. <laughs> oh, crazy. Like oh, weird. It's like this. Yeah, mine definitely has the point, has the cone shape. Yeah. The pylon shape mine nose. Like Hannibal Lecter. Ha. Huh. Crazy. Uh, Dr. Welsh, my melanaris transition to a male right now. It is pretty crazy how fish can change sex. Certain fish. It is. And, and, it, and it's weird how, like, different uh, species, like, you know, like clowns, you know, they will turn into the female. Yeah. And then with, like, antheas, they, they will turn into male. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's like, oh, we don't have one of these. Okay. <laughs> I'll <Cool>. do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yep. Whatever works. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, now, the other thing to consider, too, just speaking of that, like fish can change sex. And like antheas, for example, usually there's one male to multiple females. Um, and, you know, usually you get your one like super male and then the other ones will be more like d more submissive, I guess, of the females. And so taking that into account when you're adding fish to the tank or if you add two males, for instance, they're likely going to be a brutal brutal boo in there and they'll scrap and whatnot where if you stick to like the proper male to female ratio you're going to be more of a peaceful community in the fish so doing your homework and doing a lot of research up front before you impulse buy a fish is going to make sure you're going to have more success with them right because you you know the general mentalities of them and which ratios have been proven to have success and then if your fish are happy they're not stressed they're not fighting they're less likely to get ick or get sick with other issues well, yeah, I agreed. And like, for uh, like, um, getting into the saltwater hobby, I remember I, I, I was a crazy uh, fresh head. I was doing, you know, discus, and you know, I would, I was actually breeding um, uh, cardinals and mm -hmm. did angelfish and had Amazonian tanks, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, that's such a cool, pretty, flashy fish. I'm like, oh wow, you know, they're a lot more colorful. So, you know, I, and I got into the hobby, but like what's being said about research, you know, I didn't just dive in and be like, oh, you know what? That's a cool fish. I'm, I'm, I, I want to now start doing saltwater. I, I, I did my research. I was you know, like 13 years old. I'm like, okay, you know, let's, let's see what's going on, you know, and you ease, you ease into it and you research and, and it goes with almost any, any, almost any hobby or even any aspect of this hobby uh, to really don't just like oh my god it's a pretty fish it's it's orange and white and has a long thing and cool I'll just I'm just gonna get it and then you bring it bring it home and then you're like it's not you're like oh it's you're like oh that only eats clams there goes my overly priced maxima or the, or that <laughs> so <laughs> yep so it it definitely is worth researching that and to to that point there is some fish that are likely to eat corals and other stuff right so you got to make sure it's not going to eat something that you primarily keep in your tank um or if you have one of those fish you know maybe you know you're going to give up clams in the future and you just got to live with that so like i i, I really want to get I, I love the i think you have one the uh the the tube enemies yeah yeah they're yeah, awesome they're really, they're really pretty but uh the smaller little slower moving fish hmm. they're little snacks uh, the um, uh, again, correct correct me if I'm wrong, but like uh, I've, I've heard, like the neon gobies, you know, they are usually a good snack for those tube. Yeah, I don't I see. Don't I don't have any neon gobies, so I can't say. But my fish have all been safe. My okay. small my smallest fish is probably the cleaner wrasse in the tank, or like royal gamma maybe. But they they've all been fine. But yeah, definitely. I know back in the day, I had a carpet an enemy, and that thing could potentially, like, even a mini maxi, they can eat stuff. They, a little fish lands on it, could be done for. And they're sticky. Like even get that guy out of the tank when I eventually sold it was a bugger. It just sticks to you like crazy. <laughs> yep. Um, Andy, why don't more people try and breed saltwater fish? It's because it's harder to do. People do do it, but it's not as easy as freshwater. They're a lot more picky on setting the mood well, than freshwater fish. What well, like um. My, my buddy Matt from uh, MM Aquatics, he uh, he does uh, um, clownfish breeding, mm -hmm. and you know people have over the years, I think probably since like the '80s and '90s, have like you know got got into that and learned how to do it. 
uh, just recently, you know, uh, people are figuring out how to, you know, um, uh, breed the yellow tang. For yeah. example, people want to learn how to breed the, the blue or the, the, the purple tang. Mm-hmm. Um, with, with certain species of fish, um, the scientists are still trying to figure out, you know, how they breed mm-hmm. and what makes them trigger. And like, for, for example, like, like the, the, the hippo tang, uh, it has to be like a certain type of moon, a full moon. The water has to be perfect, this and that. And, you know, and it happens in the ocean. And, you know, scientists are trying to recreate that as a regular Joe Schmo hobbyist like myself in the basement. I'm not going to be able to breed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so certain types of fish. That's it, fair. It's, it's, it's a lot of research and a lot of just science with some of these species. Yeah. Clownfish are by far the easiest to breed, I'd say. Lots of people do those. That's why we have a bazillion different clownfish morphs. Um, yeah, they're starting to be more and more, though, which is nice to see. So it's definitely upping what's out there. So over time, I mean, more and more will come into the hobby, which will be good. Uh, I mean, honestly, I would love to see more aquaculture fish. Mm-hmm. It's it's. Yeah, I know um, we're all always, you know, let's, let's save the ocean, this and that, but, you know, we always want that. You know, like the, the uh, flame angel comes from Mar- Marshall Islands. They don't, yep. it's not bred, it's collected. But, you know, hopefully one day, you know, more and more of these fish will be aquacultured and it'll help. Exactly. And then if a fish is aquaculture captive bred, um, per- personally, I'm more likely to go for that one because they're less likely to have parasites or ick or velvet or less likely to eat your corals because they're only <laughs> raised on food right so they don't necessarily have those instincts so if i think it's a good way to go and i think eventually we'll get to that point where you know they'll be nice and affordable and plentiful usually they're a bit more like if it's triple the price i mean it's harder to bite but if they're 20 bucks more i'll happily spend it so it depends um, yeah oh yeah yeah, exactly. If it's three hundred dollars more, then it's a little more questionable. But as long as it's like reasonable, then I definitely it's think it's worth it. Yeah, I will definitely pay pay the premium for for aquaculture fish. Exactly. Uh, I, I have a buddy, one buddy, and his tank is like st- only capture bread. He'll only buy capture bread. So good for him. But it's getting there. Well, isn't is, isn't Ryan doing like a, uh, a BRS? Isn't he like doing like a uh, they said they were going to. Did they actually do it? I I know on one of his videos been, he said that was like yeah, the I've, goal or the plan. I've, been, or... I've seen the update, but I, the last time I heard, I think all all the fish he was going to do were going to be all aquaculture. So yeah, he stuck with it. We'll find out. <laughs> all right, man. It was a good one today. Thank you for joining me. It was yeah. fun. No, thank you for having me on. It was a blast. Good as always. Thanks for sharing your your ick knowledge with with the people. Yeah. And if you want to check them out, Shroomy's Reef on basically wherever you want to get your social media on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. As always, if you did, hit that like button. Um, shout out Tracy, Bruno, Melanie, Sid. Thank you guys for the super chat. Much appreciated. And we will catch you guys on next week's stream. Oh, yeah. And don't forget that like button. Thanks, guys. <laughs>